It's time for Spider-Man vs. Venom vs. Ben Riley. This is the event from Marvel Comics called Dark Web, and I need to explain a few things to get you caught up. Ben Riley is a clone of Peter Parker. He was created back in the late 90s and has popped up periodically since then as a friend, as an ally, and as a frenemy. I hate that word. He's an enemy. At this current time period, he was working for the Beyond Corporation, which stole his memories in the end. Due to his memories being muddled and weird and all kinds of messed up from the Beyond Corporation, he thinks that Peter Parker stole them from him. He then was bonded with a weird symbiote-type goo and became the villain known as Chasm. Venom has become the King in Black. This has given him the ability to travel through time, but he discovered his own timeline, where he will eventually become the evil villain known as Meritus. He needs to go through multiple transformations to become this evil villain Meritus. And as of right now, he thinks that he just murdered his own son, Dylan. And a certain individual, Madeline Pryor, is offering him a way to fix it by removing his memories of anything that currently is happening. Madeline Pryor is a clone of Jean Grey who has gone through her own problematic past. But her villainous days seemingly ended when she was given the demon realm of Limbo to rule over. Except is anyone really going to be happy with being shoved over to the demon realm of Limbo? Those are your four key players that we're going to be covering today. Spider-Man, Peter Parker, Ben Riley, Chasm, Eddie Brock, Venom, and Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen. Well, on that note, you're at Comic Storian. We tell you what stories go into giant events within the world of comic books. We then give you a synopsis with an audio narrative, and this helps you know what to add to your collection. Now that I've told you all the important bits of this story and who we are, let's get into Dark Web Dusk. As the snow falls on the busy New York street, Ben Riley and Janine go window shopping for the holidays when suddenly Ben hears his name called out. He looks over and he sees Peter and MJ. Peter says that he hates to do this on Christmas and all, but he's going to need his stuff back. Confused, Ben asks him, what stuff? <laughs> you know, man, all of it. Peter pulls at Ben's hair, and just as Ben begins to protest, Ben begins to pull off his mouth, telling him, You won't be needing this either. In fact, let's take your eyes and your brains too. Now you can be what you really are. A nothing person in a nowhere place. <laughs> but as Ben recalls those horrible memories, a voice asks him, That was unpleasant, wasn't it? To be confronted with all that they've taken? Madeline Pryor begins to walk out of the darkness. Emotion has power here in Limbo, Ben. Pain and regret are currency. I focused mine into the Scythe of Sorrows, a symbol by which I can control the demons of Limbo. But to work the magic above, you'll need me to focus your hurt into energy. Can you do that? Ben pulls down his mask, telling her, if pain is energy, then I'm full of it. Madeline tells him good. Everything that was stolen from them, they will get it all back. After working behind the scenes for several months, Madeline's plan reaches its point of fruition. The two begin to walk the hollowed halls of Limbo. Ben asks what is their next move, and Madeline says what she needs now is in Krakoa's New York base, but by agreement she is forbidden from entering it with ill intent. And of course, she can't be sending in precious Janine alone, can we? Which is why I've enlisted the help of Eddie Brock. The doors to the next room fly open, and Eddie tells her, You told me that you'd help me find my son. Yes, yes, your son. I'll help you with that. We will both get what we want, but first, your mind carries a great weight. Let's lighten the load a bit, shall we, Eddie? She begins to remove Eddie Brock's memories, reverting him to an earlier state, bringing him back to the 90s Venom. Once Eddie is effectively taken care of, Madeline proceeds to rally her demons across Limbo with a powerful song-like chant, Texas Tenebrum, over and over again. Madeline's song begins to echo throughout Limbo and seep into the real world, creating a thundering sound felt by all. Suddenly, all across New York, demons begin to take over objects, terrorizing people. And across town, Peter's spider sense begins to blare. He quickly changes into his suit to try and get a better feel of what is going on. But as he reaches the top of a building, he begins to see dozens of demon-possessed objects attacking. You know, this is why I never go to Rockefeller Center around Christmas. 
However, Spider-Man isn't the only one throwing himself into the fray as several X-Men have also been swept up into the fight. But for them, fighting the demons of Limbo has already given them the idea of who is behind it. With the immediate heroes busy, Madeline tells Janine, the new villain reborn as Hollow's Eve. We don't have time to waste, Janine. Judging by the way our new friend is moving, they shouldn't have any issues. But as news of what is happening across New York spreads, Norman Osborn sits in his office listening to the news when he suddenly turns it off. He spins around in his chair to look at the new Golden Glider prototype suit that he once wore to save Peter asking, what harm could it do? A voice then tells him, hey Norman, remember me? You sound like Peter. That I do, but I didn't come here to get into all of that. The name's Ben Riley. Ring any bells? You know what it does, what do you want? That's a bit tricky. There's an answer. Just saying it's tricky is all. See, my memories, some of them were Peter's and some of them were mine, and I lost all of Peter's, and now he won't give them back. And to be honest, I'm pretty sure some of them were important. Worst yet, Peter didn't let me keep my own memories. The ones that he did leave me with are mostly bad, you know, like pain and betrayal. So when I think of you, well, I really only remember him. Norman leaps from his seat, calling out the activation code for the Golden Glider, but before the suit could activate, Ben kicks him in the back and into the wall. Norman coughs up blood, pulling out the remote for his suit, pressing the button, nearly taking Ben out in the process. Once the suit is on, Norman puts on the helmet, telling him that he wants nothing more than to make amends for the things that he has done. But his kidney is bruised, and he can assume that this isn't going to be the end of it. Ben picks up the remote. I have a funny story. I posed as Peter and got all of his gear. Watch this. Ben presses a button and the glider explodes at Norman's feet, knocking him to the ground. He then walks over. How about we go back to making those amends that I was talking about, huh? One amend, two amend. He continues to punch the weakened Norman over and over, but elsewhere, Madeline Pryor glares. We had an agreement. And a voice in the shadows tells her, that was before. Madeline asks, Before what exactly? Venom peers out. Before we knew that he was here. We will finally kill him. We will have our vengeance. Venom leaps away and Madeline says that she and Ben tried to make him malleable. But they have taken too much of his memories away. And Hollow's Eve chimes in. Yeah, I'd say so. Leaping out in the city, the old, feral, brain-eating Venom shouts out, We're going to eat Spider-Man's brain! With Limbo's demons beginning to take over New York, Peter Parker swings through the man-eating trees and avoids the flying books. Okay, things are starting to get really out of control here. Norman just sent out a distress call, which is bad considering he's the one who tends to help me figure these things out. The screams of people get louder as Peter forces himself to continue on to Oscorp. But as he arrives, he finds Norman and Ben Riley. Norman is knocked out and Ben tells him, Oh, it looks like your boss slipped and fell. Hell of a night, isn't it? Is that you, Ben? Please, while we're working on Chasm! Peter hurries over. I knew you were alive. I could feel it. Thank God. Is everything okay? I'm going to take a guess and say that you don't know what's happening here, Peter. You threw me away. And now I'm back to take back the life that was stolen from me. This whole city's going to suffer until I get what I want. What? Wait, all of- You're doing this? Do you think you could just forget about me so easily? Might want to check that spider sense. Wait, it doesn't work on him, does it? Before Peter could even ask, Venom cackles as he swings in, grabbing Peter by the head. Oh, Peter says. He finds himself pinned. Well, it's time to get back to work. Goodbye, Peter Parker. Peter picks himself back up, looking back. Eddie! No, we are Venom! Look, please don't take this the wrong way, but you sounded a bit dumber. Venom begins to walk forward. We've never thought more clearly. We'll give you one guess what we want, and it rhymes with brains. It's just brains, isn't it? You, you just want to eat my brains. Yes! Peter punches Venom, yelling out, Too bad! As Venom punches back with a thunderous crack. Normally, Peter would be able to avoid or at least soften the hit with his spider sense, but clearly that is something that he's been relying on too much as of late. 
He just needs a few seconds too. But before he could fly into something, Venom webs him up, flinging him back with another punch. Venom begins to smile wide. This is easier than we thought. Maybe your brain is so small we'll be able to eat it in one bite. Hey, my brain is a four-course meal, Venom. And my spider sense isn't my only trick in the book. I also know how to run. Peter begins to swing away to lure Venom away from the people around him, but he stops by a newsstand to pick up a magazine and a lighter, to which the sentient news cart then tries to eat him for. But as Venom eventually catches up, he begins to laugh. <laughs> are you running out of breath? Maybe your lungs are sad and weak as your pathetic, flavorless brain. Peter says that he's not going to be baited into a debate on his brain's flavor profile. He's got other plans. He lights the magazine on fire. <laughs> Your brain is a scant meal if you think a puny flame will stop us. Peter begins to wave the burning book. I'm not interested in scaring you. I'm going to burn these Christmas trees to the ground. And that's when the possessed trees begin to scream. The high-pitched sound waves begin to wreak havoc on the symbiote. Peter lunges forward, punching Eddie out of Venom's hold. And as the trees begin to hop away, calling Peter a monster, he tells them, you know it was a bluff, right? I wasn't gonna burn you, trees. But a voice tells Peter that he has something that belongs to her. And on this particular night, that is a very dangerous thing. Madeline Pryor steps into view and Peter stares for a moment. You really look like Jean. But Madeline hushes him. Yes, I've heard, but let's not say her name. I might get upset and take your mouth. Is that something you could do? Quite. Better keep it shut. Forget that we were here. We're doing secret work that requires Edward Brock. The two possessed mailboxes begin to take Eddie away. Hey, you can't take Eddie. He's unhinged. That's a matter of perspective. He tried to eat my brain. Okay, he's unhinged. But you've got other things to worry about. It seems our mutual friend has completed his chores. Ben then jumps down. Hello, Peter. Where were we? But now we cut to a little before all the events. We go see what the X-Men were doing right as everything started. The streets of Manhattan were extra busy as the holidays were approaching and everyone was out in full force getting their last minute gifts for their loved ones. But as Jean, Cyclops, and Magic made their way to the next store, Jean begins to notice disturbances all over the city. As several possessed buses, mailboxes, and scooters begin to attack people, Jean calls on the other X-Men and Magic says that they just need to look on the bright side. The treehouse isn't under attack. Madeline is magically bound from attacking Krakoa in any way. As the others arrive, Iceman freezes some of the demons asking, all right, so what is the plan here? We're just on defense for this? And Cyclops tells him, no, we're on offense too. But that means Magic tells him, okay, one stepping disc to limbo coming up. Magic begins their teleportation with Cyclops telling Iceman and Firestar not to let New York go to hell. Not during the holidays. Gene states that they should grab Havoc on the way. He's down the street fighting a bunch of very angry looking shopping carts. So once Gene, Cyclops, and Magic disappear, Firestar and Iceman get to work stopping the rampaging construction equipment when Iceman notices one of the demons is escaping. Fools! None of you can stand against the might of Limbo! Yeah, we should probably keep up with that one, Iceman tells Firestar. The demon flies towards Rockefeller Center, perching himself up atop the tree and relieves himself, infecting the tree with his dark magic. One of the children looks up, asking if he just made a boom boom in the tree. And the child's mother retches, gross, this city sucks. But soon the tree begins to transform. Ho, oh, oh, ho, holy crap, time to die. I live to serve the Goblin Queen. The tree swipes at the ice skaters below, and Iceman speeds by grabbing everyone, telling Firestar to go ahead and give the tree the business. She opens fire with her flame abilities. Okay, it's still a tree, right? Because she notices that it's screaming in pain when there's a sudden thwip as Spider-Man swings in. Wow, to celebrate everlasting life, the mutants immediately start a war on Christmas, huh? No wonder Orchis doesn't like you. The tree then begins to thrash about, punching into one of the nearby buildings and pulls somebody out. And the heroes quickly assure the man to stay calm and that everything will be okay. As Firestar rescues the man, Iceman covers the hole in the building with ice, telling Spider-Man that he appreciates the save. Spider-Man then continues to swing around, webbing up the tree, telling him, No biggie. I clocked in the last time one of yours turned the city into demonic shenanigans too. So whose fault is this one? Iceman informs Spider-Man that it's actually a sad case. 
They think that there's an old clone of Jean Grey's that is sad and... Ah, say no more! I've got my own clone issues. Always makes the holidays difficult. But soon, the demonic tree begins to break free of the webs and ice, shouting, Tree hates you! And Spider-Man tells him that this is why every year he writes to the mayor's office to beg for a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Firestar shakes her head, stating that she really hopes the others are having more fun in Limbo. Meanwhile, over in Limbo, Magix teleports everyone in, stating that she wanted to bring them far enough away so that they could sneak in. But judging by that small mountain being thrown at them, she's going to guess that Maddie already knows. A giant boulder is hurtling at them, and Cyclops asks if he can blast it. Jean tells him no, she's going to catch it. However, as she does catch it, she notices that something is off. She's getting really tired. And Magic calls out, oh no, it's the sleep demons! I'll teleport us back out! But before she could, the demons managed to put all four mutants to sleep. Back on Earth, the giant Christmas tree is burning. I suffer burning in the flames of mankind. This place is awful hell. I did not ask to be born. A demon emptied itself on me. Firestar watches. Oh, this is really a bummer. My dad's coming into town next week to see this tree. Iceman quickly freezes it over as it continues to ramble. I can't put it out of its misery, but I can at least shut it up. As everyone begins to boo the X-Men, Firestar asks if they're booing, and Iceman says, Hey, you can't boo us. Besides, you all loved when Tim Burton did this stuff, but not us. Spider-Man lands, telling them, Okay, well, that happened. We should definitely not team up ever again. Very uncomplimentary power set. But just then, Spider-Man gets a distress call from Norman Osborn requesting his help. He swings off telling everyone good luck with whatever it is that they're going to be doing, and to take it from him, don't get cloned. Meanwhile, back in Limbo, Jean and Magic are kept asleep as Cyclops and Havoc begin to wake up. As they do, Cyclops says every time he has sympathy for Maddie, she goes off and does something like this. Havoc says that he doesn't know what that's like. To not be the one leading the charge. To be left behind. To be used up. Chewed up and spit out. Yeah, I can understand it. We're the same. Cyclops stops and stares. What are you wearing? Havoc looks at the tattered robes. Give me a break. I woke up like this. And stop changing the subject. Cyclops looks at the chains on his leg and says maybe he can break this but he can't get a hold of anyone telepathically. So, Maddie then says it's because his telepath isn't available right now. Cyclops tells her to release them. New York is a living hell. And Madeline asks what's new. Suddenly the chains holding the Summers brothers begin to rattle and whip, cracking the both of them in the back of the heads, knocking them out. She begins to laugh. <laughs> We're going to have a little fun and I'm going to get everything that I want. And the two of you get to watch. Back over with Spider-Man and Ben Riley. Ben begins to recall the last time that they met, at the end of the Beyond arc. He was holding the one thing that could give him hope, the helmet from Beyond that would allow Peter to share his memories with Ben Riley. But that never happened. Instead of sharing, he just smashed it and kicked Ben into a pool of psychoreactive goo. Peter stared Ben down. I have to be honest, that is not how I remember it going. That's exactly how I remember it, Peter! Peter shouts, you just said your memory was destroyed. Did I? That part's a little foggy, Pete. Peter, in a rare situation, is at a loss for words. No, I'm not doing this. It doesn't matter. Anyone who threatens this city has a problem. As the two of them begin to get into a punching match, Peter webs up a possessed scooter, throwing it at Ben, followed by a kick, launching him into a nearby pile of trash. Ben shakes his head as he sits up, asking, where did you go? But the scooter then asks if either of those pieces of crap would like to tip him back up. Ignoring the profanity spewing scooter, Ben stands back up telling him, I still have spider sense, you know. It's been acting a little weird lately. Peter rushes in smacking Ben with a parking meter, but the energy from Ben's spider sense lashes out, stunning and shocking Peter in the process. He falls back. What the hell was that? My spider sense started playing offensive after you dropped me into that psychoreactive goo. Dude, you jumped into the psychoreactive goo. Ben begins to spin his webs. Either way, I got some new tricks. Anything you can do, I can do weirder. Soon the webs that Ben was spinning begins to take the form of an ax, and then he grabs a hold of the ax, swinging it. Batter up! Peter ducks, grabbing the handle. This is why we never made the baseball team. He begins to spin more webs, this time forming a club, bashing it across Peter's head. Peter stumbles back and Ben pulls out a small orb. We're almost done. I just have one more thing to show you and it's a humdinger. 
Peter jumps in, punching Ben. If we're exchanging gifts, then I got you a new concussion. <laughs> You've been holding back for so long, you don't even realize it. Now imagine me, someone who has all your power and none of the responsibility. I don't want to hurt you, Ben. And Ben charges back in. That's exactly why you're going to lose! Peter begins to call out to Ben through the barrage of punches, but Ben starts to hit harder, telling him, When we're working, call me Chasm! Peter falls back, struggling to regain himself, and Ben picks up the small orb. This thing better not be broken. <laughs> Shalahalati! Just then, a spike forms on the orb, and Ben throws it. But just before hitting Peter, it stops sticking into the ground. Peter looks at the glowing orb and sees Jonah and Robbie, two of his friends, shouting, what did you do to them? Where are they? They're in limbo, of course. Though for how long is anyone's guess? Bring them back, Ben. And how am I supposed to do that? We're down here. You couldn't possibly want to go to limbo. Peter pulls off his mask. Is that the game you're playing? You want me to go to limbo? Fine, Ben. Take me to limbo. <laughs> Good. It sounded like you meant it. Maddie said you can only come if you mean it. Just then, a fissure begins to open up as several tentacles reach out of the hole and snatch Peter, pulling him down into limbo. This isn't over! I'll be back! No, it's not over, but relax. You'll be down soon enough. I'm just going to enjoy the sights for a few moments because it's been a fantastic day. Peter closes his eyes as he begins to struggle, and suddenly he feels himself freeing, and he opens his eyes again. He looks around and sees that he's wearing a normal t-shirt and sweater vest, sitting at a desk. And then a voice shouts, Parker, you're late! Peter stares at what would be the demonic version of Jonah Jameson, shouting at him to get back to work along his demon colleagues. Oh boy, what did Ben do? We now go to Venom 14, which tells you how Venom became a part of the event. So we go back to before Dark Web began again. After spending some time in the Garden of Time, a symbiote paradise at the end of time, Eddie Brock was desperate to return home to return to his son, Dylan's Psy. But while escaping the garden and slipping back into the time stream, Eddie wound up in limbo where he met its ruler, Madeline Pryor and Ben Riley, just as the two were formulating their plans to get back to their original counterparts to fix their missing memory problem. This is when Madeline told Eddie that she can help him find Dylan but only if he helps her with her plans. Eddie tells her that he wants them both to understand one thing. I came back here to break out of a future that I've created. I don't want to become the villain Meredith. I want to save my son from this. My son is my only priority. I will cross dimensions for him. Understand if you two betray me in any way. But Ben stops him. Relax. We're old friends, right, Eddie? That isn't a rhetorical question. I don't actually know. Eddie listens, telling him, I know your voice. Ah, then you have one up on me. All I have is a hole where memories used to be, like a chasm. But anyway, for us to get to work, we're going to need to do something first, Eddie. We just need to poke around in that big old head of yours and... Oh, oh wow. Is this what it's like being a dad? As Ben uses his altered spider sense to tap into Eddie's brain, he tells him, Don't worry. We're going to reset you back to factory settings. And after you do one little thing for us, you'll be able to see Dylan again, Eddie. Eddie screams in pain and then stops. Dylan. Who's Dylan? Since that moment, Eddie's mind has reverted back to where it was when he first bonded with Venom. Mindless. Obsessed with eating brains. Feral. He's already had his running with Spider-Man at this point and lost, and Madeline allowed him to pursue Spider-Man so that his mind could be clear for his actual objective. Carry out an attack on the X-Men's treehouse located in the middle of New York. Once Madeline gives the signal, Venom is unleashed, but there was a snag in Madeline's plan. The treehouse was supposed to be empty. She already has Jean Grey Magic and the Summers Brothers trapped in the limbo, while Firestar, Iceman, and Forge were out fighting against the demon-possessed New York. But over with the fight between Venom and Sink, the X-Men in the treehouse, Sink uses his powers to simulate the symbiote bonded to Eddie and he attacks. Sink attacks to extract information from Eddie's mind, telling him that he isn't just some random symbiote, is it he? You're some kind of symbiote hive leader. You could do a lot with that, if only you could remember how to do it. 
Venom asks, What? No! No, stop! Stop Spider-Man! In Eddie's mind, all he can do is see that Sink looks like Spider-Man, telling him, I'm alone! All alone! No! We are Venom! Make it stop! Make it stop! The conflict in Eddie's mind forces him to flee, trying to rip Venom apart. But losing control of himself results in Eddie transforming into the terror known as Bedlam. A baser, rage-induced symbiote form from the Garden of Time. Further down Eddie's timeline to where he eventually becomes Meridus. However, as Bedlam is now running through the city, a voice calls out, Dad! And Bedlam stops to look back and see Dylan is bonded with the real Venom. But back over with the X-Men. After finally obtaining the Cerebro Drive from the treehouse, Madeline Pryor is finally able to regain what she lost. Memories of her son, Nathan, growing up, but not just the memories of, but the feelings of her son. Though she herself is a clone, she is the mother of the future mutant known as Cable, but she'll never be able to experience the feeling of motherhood. As Madeline goes through the drive, she quickly realizes that this object is simply a recorder of memories, which she already has. She needs the feeling and the emotions. That's what she's after. That's what Jean took from her, which means that she's going to go to the source directly and tap directly into Jean's mind to force her to experience them once more. Inside the dreamscape, a young Jean and Magic wake up after a long nap, unaware of what is even happening, let alone who each other is. The young Magic begins to kick Jean, telling her to wake up. How do we get outside of the creepy old house? You better not be a kidnapper. Jean gets up, telling her, ouch. She doesn't have to kick her. She doesn't have any clue what's going on as much as they do. And with that, they both begin to wander through this old stinky mansion. Meanwhile, back in regular limbo, Cyclops calls out to Madeline to please give him his visor back. He won't use his power to try and escape again. She really didn't have to surround his head with puppies. That's when we see, almost like a baby's pinwheel toy, a bunch of puppies are spinning around Scott's head. Madeline steps into the chamber, stating that they must think that she's stupid. Go ahead, open your eyes to find your visor. If you don't mind blasting puppy innards around the room, you don't, do you? Havoc tries to talk her down, but she simply asks, is she in therapy? She didn't think so. So Havoc tries to just offer to help, but she says that she doesn't need his help. Plus, they're just pulling some X-Men trick. Havoc tells her that he's not, he's quitting the X-Men, and it's not where he should be. Forge put him on the team just so he'd become a headache for Cyclops. Maybe he's supposed to be an X-Men, just not this team of them. Madeline pauses for a moment and says that she'll consider Havoc's offer, but she has to go. Her spell is ready. Back in the dreamscape, young Jean and young Magic hear the cries for help, and they rush in to find Madeline being attacked by little nightcrawler devils. Magic uses her stick to smack them away, and Madeline tells them thanks. She just woke up here, and she isn't sure how long she's been stuck here. The answers they're all looking for are inside of this device, but she doesn't know how to open it. Maybe they do? Jean takes the Cerebro Drive and looks at it, telling her that it looks familiar. Maybe it needs a key. And Madeline tells her, yes, yes. Just imagine opening it, Jean. Back out in regular limbo, Cyclops is keeping his eyes closed around the puppies, telling Havoc that he might be onto something about lying about quitting the team. Maddie seems unbalanced. Havoc tells him that he isn't lying. He doesn't belong here. He deserves to be somewhere that he is needed, somewhere that he wants to be. The public X-Men team already has a Summers leading it. They don't need Havoc. It takes only a few more moments, but Cyclops finally apologizes. Forge didn't throw Havoc on the team to embarrass him. He thought maybe something could be fixed, but maybe not. And Havoc just tells him he's fine. He's been an X-Men and an Avenger. He's done good and bad. He's ready to use all of that for good. But right now, they can't move forward stuck like this, and maybe they can try reaching out to Jean. Back in the dreamscape, Madeline brings Jean to Cerebro, telling her that that's it. Put on the helmet, and you can get the information out of the box. Once you have it, everything will be okay. But as she does, Jean can hear Cyclops calling out to her, explaining that Madeline has placed them all under a spell, and they are stuck in limbo. I love you, Jean. You're the most powerful X-Men. She stares at the helmet where she sees her reflection, but not the reflection of the child Jean that she thinks that she is. She sees her adult form. She begins to regain herself and her memories, getting up, knocking everyone aside, looking at Maddie, bringing us before we had our gifts. Very unsporting of you. Madeline glares. 
how rich it is to be lectured on what is fair by Jean Grey. Jean steps forward. End this, Maddie. Not until I get what I want, Jean. And with that, Jean delivers a telepathic slap that can be heard around the world. Back over with Spider-Man, who is currently contained within the world of Limbo. We discover that Ben Riley has also captured J. Jonah Jameson and Robbie Robinson in an attempt to force Peter out in the open. Ben's plan worked, and he took the three down to a part of Limbo that he refashioned to look like New York, complete with a daily bugle and demon co-workers. But as Peter is crossing the street, he noticed one of the demons is truly committing to his role as a human. The other demon walking with him gets upset, threatening to bite his head off, so Peter runs up. What did I tell you about that? Humans don't bite the heads off of other humans. The demon turns back, shouting that he can't take it anymore, wearing stupid human clothes. Arr! But before the demon could chomp down on Peter, he punches him, sending him spinning. The other, smaller, enthusiastic demon is excited. You saved me. It's not your job. But anyway, sorry. It's just a force of habit. I really need to go to work now. The demon calls out that he's the meat man that they call Parker Pete Man. And Peter sighs. Close enough. Inside, Jonah tells the demons that they need to go out and get him a story, but all the demons yell that they need him to be mad. You're not taking this serious, J. Johnny John man! Jonah tells him that wasn't even close to his name, but another demon says, It's all way close. Maybe we should bite your ears if you're not using them. Peter rushes in, grabbing the demon. If you touch Jonah, we're gonna have problems. And another demon tells him, You know what happens to John man and all your friends if you don't work, right? Look, let's all just be respectful and get to work, Peter says, as he tries to ignore the situation. As he goes out for his assignment, Ben stops him. Ha! Another tough day at the office, Pete? Just let us go, Ben. This is between us. Come on, you don't think I went to all the trouble of making Limbo look like home just to be turned down. So why not just take a little nibble on this apple and we can call it a day, Pete? No, I know what you want from me, what you think I stole from you, but I'm not playing your game. Look, I'm being nice. I could force this apple down your throat. I don't really think you can, or you would have done that already. In fact, it would seem that whatever that fruit is, I need to eat it willingly, which means that I have to give up. And if that's what you're wanting, you've lost your mind. I will never let you leave, Pete. I wasn't planning on asking for permission, Ben. Later that evening, Jonah is trying to go to bed, with his bed telling him to come to bed. But eventually, Peter shows up at the window, trying to talk things out with Jonah. They talk about the weird piece of fruit that they seem to really want Peter to eat. But Peter explains that that got him thinking. If Ben is attacking New York, then there must be a way back up to New York and back down to Limbo. So tomorrow, when they go to work, Peter's going to give the signal, and hopefully, they'll be able to catch a ride out. However, he's going to have to replace his costume. You got a thimble by any chance? The next morning, Jonah calls all the demons in stating that he got a lead on a red hot story. You're not a bunch who's just going to let someone scoop up a red hot story, are you? The demons all shout no, and Jonah straightens his tie. Good, because this is deadly serious. Apparently, some demons have been allowed to go up to the real New York. Instead of dressing in a suit and tie, they're hunting humans, making them scream, making them cry. Word is, they all do it. Scream, cry, and bleed. Good thing that isn't us, right? The demons all nervously nod. Yeah, not us. Good, because I'm looking for a few brave reporters to shine a light on this injustice. Reporters who will sleuth and investigate and never join in on these heinous crimes, which we all agree would be no fun. The demons all begin to stare at one another when suddenly they all make a break for the door, shouting that this is their story. No, this is my story. No, this is my story. All of them arguing over it. Robbie looks at Jonah. I can't believe that worked. I can. It wasn't that hard to get into their heads. Peter crawls through the window, telling them that it's time. Let's move. But as he attempts to leave, he meets the sinister six replicants that were created for Limbo. Gorpion, Grave Goblin, Ryotrops, and Dr. Octoball attack, with Dr. Octoball asking, Do we remind you of home, Wallcrawler? Is this how you like to spend your days? Peter looks back at them, very monotone. Oh yeah, what a blast. Kraken the Hunter picks him up. No crap. Peter tries to swing away, but someone stops him, and he looks up, asking, how can this get any weirder? But another demon dressed as Spider-Man. They said they didn't need another Parker, that he had it backwards. 
say hello to Rec Rap, which is now the demon replicant of Peter Parker. As the mindless Bedlam runs through the streets of Manhattan, punching cars out of his way, he screams at Dylan, Give Venom back! Give it now! Dylan dodges the flying cars and Bedlam tells him, You are different, not the Venom I know. Things changed. What have you done? It was you, father. Don't you remember pain? You said pain would make me stronger. Then you stabbed me in the heart and you left. In that moment, everything changed. Dylan summons the all-black sword swinging it, cutting an arm off. Bedlam screams, and Dylan tells him, It will not grow back. Once the all-black severs the flesh from your body, it is severed from the hive, from your mind. Do you understand what this means? I'm going to kill you! Bedlam grins for a moment and then begins to laugh, telling him, and I will walk back into Meredith's garden, where I will replenish my flesh. Once I have ended you and taken back Venom, I can understand why Meredith yearned for this new form of Venom. It is powerful, but I am the King in Black. I am God, and no one will be able to take me down alone. Bedlam grabs a hold of Dylan, who said I was on my own, father? Suddenly, tendrils lash out, grabbing Bedlam by the arms, pulling him off of Dylan. When Bedlam looks back, he sees another symbiote, one with the face of a goblin. Is that really you, Mr. Brock, in there? I never thought I'd see you in red. Earlier that night, before engaging with Eddie, Dylan made a stop at Alchemex, specifically to see his buddy, Normie Osborne. He told Normie that he needed help, that his dad was alive and that he was trapped. But for Dylan to free Eddie, he was going to need Normie's help. Normie asked what is he supposed to do, and Dylan held out a symbiote. The symbiote slowly began to bond with Normie as he tells him, This is what my mom was afraid of. She's worried that I'm going to become a creature of nightmares again. Dylan tells him that their parents can't keep them from being who they are. Their fears are always of the past, but Normie is not Carnage. He is not his grandfather. You are something new. There's no going back. There's only one way through this. Forward. Back at the fight, Bedlam lashes out. It doesn't matter. None of this matters, don't you see? I am not the possibility. I am the consequence. If I exist, I must win this battle and the next and the next. There's another swing from the all black and an eye from Bedlam is removed as he screams. Bedlam shakes his head. I see now. You are not Venom. You are not just Venom. Dylan stands back up as Codex. I will show you the meaning of fear, father. I will show you what you're made of. I will kill you if I have to. Just then a voice calls out telling them, all right, hold on a second because there's not gonna be any killing. Everyone looks up to see Miss Marvel as she goes on telling them, if there's any killing, I'm gonna be in a lot of trouble, guys. But back over with the X-Men, we travel back in time once again. Once upon a time, Mr. Sinister thought to clone Jean Grey, and he called her Madeline Pryor. His plan was to have Cyclops fall in love with Madeline Pryor, and hopefully they would have a rather interesting child. They did, and the child Cable changed the course of mutantdom forever. Soon after, the Jean copy was discarded by the villains and even the heroes. The real Jean returned to raise the child Nathan. Life went on. Hearts were broken once more. But now Maddie sits upon the limbo throne and she desires memories of the days that Jean lived in her stead, especially those about the baby she lost to the future. But as Madeline searches through the Cerebro Drive, Jean asks what is it that she is looking for, and Madeline yells that she wants what was stolen from her! The two begin to fight their psychic battle with Jean telling Madeline that she does not need her gift to feel the despair. No more games, no more tricks. This ends now, Madeline! Jean's attention turns towards the drive and with her power, she shatters it before Madeline Pryor. Madeline falls to her knees, distraught, confused. Why? You took the memories from me again. Why? Not this time, Jean. I will. But Jean cuts through the psychic rocks being thrown at her and punches Madeline. Stand down. You can have what you want. And Madeline tells her, I shall. 
She twirls her finger and a portal to limbo opens up as demons tackle Jean Grey. But all that has done is make her mad as she blows them all off. They go back and forth, more psychic rocks being thrown at Jean and magic arrives wondering what she missed. But Jean informs her that what she missed is that she is surrendering. Madeline and magic stare at her. You are? Magic tells her, okay, I'm gonna go see what the others are doing, Jean. You work this out. Magic leaves and Jean lets down her guard floating there. I wanted to heal your wounds, Madeline, but someone was too busy throwing rocks to hear me. I wasn't looking to hurt you with the drive. But Madeline sighs. No, this isn't about you, Jean. I just, I never got over losing Nathan. I gave birth to him alone in a kitchen. Jean closes her eyes. He was a good and quiet baby. She was after the memories of her time with Nathan before he had to leave, right? Madeline says she wants it all. The good, the bad, the first steps, the burps, the farts. So Jean focuses her powers and says that she can have them. Just like that, the memories of raising Cable begin to flood into Madeline's mind. Madeline stumbles back. I didn't think you'd just... But Jean tells her that just because she's giving those memories to Madeline doesn't mean that she's losing them. She didn't have them as long as she'd like. Mutants grow up fast especially the summers, but right now the world is still burning and New York needs the X-Men. So say the words. Madeline is stunned. Really? But Jean laughs, lending her power to her. Here's the microphone. Madeline turns and shouts, To me, my X-Men! Seconds later, Cyclops and Havoc run in, holding several puppies. Cyclops says that they're a little behind since they had to save these guys. What's going on? Havoc informs Madeline that he meant what he said before about helping her. This team doesn't need him, but it doesn't mean that he isn't an X-Man. Madeline tells him that she owes him an apology. Jean goes on explaining that the X-Men are about second chances. That's why she kept pushing the council to resurrect Madeline Pryor. Moments later, Magic arrives with the others, stating that the gang is all here. Did we miss anything? Big fight? Maybe some kissing? Madeline tells her that she missed her learning who the X-Men really are and what it means to be one. They put their faith in her and she let them down. This is her mess, and she is still the queen of limbo. So it's time for her to clean up. Magic stops everyone. Okay, that's cool and all, but do we have to return the puppies to their owners? Would it be okay if we kept one or two of them? With the X-Men having their truce in limbo, Madeline set off to make things right by retracting all of the demons that went to New York. But her first stop was to take care of things at home, which includes Ben Riley. Ben is sitting by the demonic fruit tree asking her how it's going. Who would have thought that it'd be so hard to get Peter to eat an apple, huh? <laughs> but hey, if that's how I get my memories back, I'm in it for the long haul. Madeline tells him that that's it. It's over. Jean, she showed her uncommon kindness. She gave it to her freely, all the precious memories of raising the child. That's great. And believe me, Peter is close to breaking Madeline. He might be trying to escape right now, but once he's put back in his place, he'll cave for sure. No. What we've done, it has to end. I have to stop this, Ben. Stop? The way I see it, we've only come halfway. Or did we agree to forget about me the moment you got what you wanted? It's funny, this rejection, this betrayal, it doesn't even hurt. Feels like home. Ben swings off as Madeline looks to Hollow's Eve, stating that she hopes that she can understand. Eve tells her that it's okay. They take care of themselves, they always do. Meanwhile, back in the mean streets of New York Limbo, or Limbo, New York, or wherever Peter is, Peter finds himself an unexpected ally in the demonic form of him, Wreck Rap. Yep, that's me, and you'll never guess where that name came from! I already guessed it, and I hate it, Wreck Rap. Octoball yells, Wait! Demons are supposed to break the spider, not dress up like him! Did you hear that? The Insidious Six have teamed up to defeat us! What do you say we start this off with some classic web wanging? What? You know, web wanging! And with that, Wreck Rap begins to fire dozens of web balls from his finger guns. Pow, 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 pow! Octoball shouts out that no one web wangs the Insidious Six. And Peter sighs. Let's just punch them, okay, Wreck Rap? But while Peter is busy battling alongside his demonic clone back at Madeline's tower, Madeline prepares to give the announcement to all of the demons to return to Limbo when Eve stops to check on her. Eve then puts on the Frankenstein mask, turning herself into Frankenstein, grabbing Madeline's scythe of sorrows, pushing her over the ledge, telling her not to scream. She let her keep her head. Then maybe her power deserves someone with a little less responsibility.
Back with the spider duo, Rec Rack keeps firing his finger guns, making every possible popping sound, with Peter telling him that if he's going to make the sound every time, at least pick one. You got it, champ! The two continue to batter down on the baddies, with Peter making a break for it, stating that they need to get Jonah and Robbie to the portal, so stay close. Or run away as fast as you can. Not sure which one is my preference right now, Rec Rap. But as Peter is leading the others to their possible freedom, Ben finds himself under the withering demonic tree. I had hoped that I'd convince Peter one last time. Beg even. Guess on top of everything, I've forgotten who's really in charge. Eve walks up smiling. Yeah, who was in charge? All of Limbo's leaders have a weapon, a symbol of their authority, and if they lose it, well, they lose their authority. So take the scythe, and then whatever else you want. Ben grabs it, immediately beginning to feel the power of Limbo flooding into him as he becomes the king. But the transformation stopped. He declared, All hail, King Chasm! Over in the city, Peter and the others arrive at the portal that the demons are using to get to the city. But they're stopped when there's a sudden boom that shakes the underworld as it Ben effortlessly lands there. Forget about home. It's already damned. And I'm the one who condemned it to hell when you refuse to offer me your soul. Oh, cool. Congrats on making yourself weirder, Ben. Ben effortlessly slaps Peter away with Rec Rap yelling, That was my sidekick, you sick! But Ben grabs the demon by the throat, slamming him into the ground. He then focuses his newfound power, piercing a hole in the sky, summoning a tower that goes straight into Central Park. Later, Peter begins to come to and he asks where they left off. Jonah tells him that they left. Are you doing okay? Peter tells him no. The others all gather around with Cyclops asking who is that? Rec Rap! The web-whipping wall prancer! Peter tells Cyclops to just ignore him, and Madeline offers her hand, asking if Peter will join them in the final fight. But back over with Venom, as the fight comes to a brief pause between Codex and Bedlam, Codex looks back at Miss Marvel, stating that they're kind of in the middle of something here. Yeah, you're in the middle of stabbing someone in the eye, who I'm pretty sure I heard you say was your father? Yeah, this is my dad, and I didn't just carve out his eye. I chopped off his hand, too. Now I'm gonna tear out his throat! You got a problem with that? Come on, Venom! Putting a little kid in a symbiote suit and making him a sidekick? That's insanely irresponsible. Can we just, like, talk this out? No, no talk. Boy hurt me, so boy dies! Bedlam shouts out. Miss Marvel grows her arms, holding Bedlam in place. He struggles to free himself, biting on her hand, and then promptly getting thrown across New York. Codex demands to know why she did that. He's dangerous, and now they can't stop him. Stay put. I'm going to handle this. I threw him towards the Hudson. It'll take him a minute to swim back to shore. Plus, with all the demonic panic right now, the tourist spots are closed. It may not look it, but I've been doing this for quite a while. Codex just yells at her that she doesn't understand. And then he begins to scream as he falls to his knees. She wants to know what's going on, and he explains that he cannot hold the Codex form for long. He can't hold the Necro Sword for long. He then reverts back to his human self, and Miss Marvel realizes that Dylan is just a kid as well. Yeah, look who's talking, Miss Marvel. Look, I'm actually a young adult now, but I'm definitely older than a 10-year-old sidekick who... Wait, where did your sidekick go? Meanwhile, back at the pier, Bedlam begins to climb up onto the shore as he hears a voice calling out to him. He growls as he stands up. Merry dish. <laughs> it's been quite the day, hasn't it, Bedlam? Sporting the whole new look already? Seems Chasm's little memory mojo really did some work on your mind. Ironically, I can remember how that felt. The confusion, the rage, the difficulty thinking straight. It's no wonder you want so badly to get to Venom back. It's the only thing that you can hold on to. Everything else is... Bedlam. On the other hand, there is a want of the Garden of Time. You want to go back to it, which is quite the turnaround. I want to go back to regrow and take the throne from you. You'll make an attempt. But why come to the garden when the garden can come to you? Consider this a down payment. You'll need a strong right hand when the time comes. As Meredith gives a part of himself to regrow Bedlam's arm, I'll never be yours. Never is a really long time, Eddie. You'll get the eye back when you're ready to come back to the garden for real. Oh, and one last thing. If your other has a sword, why don't you? Bedlam looks at his arm for a moment and thinks, and it transforms into a chainsaw. This will do. At that moment, Normie jumps down. Whoa, that is so cool! And Bedlam grims. It is so cool. Come closer. Look with your face. 
Bedlam swings his giant arm, and Normie flies around using his goblin webs to tie down Bedlam. Normie then taunts him for being stuck, so Bedlam revs up his chainsaw, cutting off the restraints. As he gets ready to attack, though, a voice yells that they'll take it from here, and Dylan, back in his original Venom suit, jumps in. No, you're not me! We, we are Venom! If we are not Venom, who are we? Give me back Venom! Dylan swings his chains, keeping Bedlam back. I'm sorry, Dad, but some things you can never have back. The two of them get ready for their ultimate showdown, but that's when some possessed benches begin to take bets on who's going to win. That distracts Normie and Miss Marvel while Dylan and Bedlam continue their final fight, with Dylan shouting, You abandoned me! You abandoned us! King of every symbiote in the universe, except the one you didn't want to bother with! Saving every soul in the galaxy, but never checking on your own son! What's wrong with you?! Even after all of that, I wanted to save you, to make sure nobody could get hurt again. But maybe we can end this pain right now. At that moment, before Dylan could strike Bedlam down, a projection of Madeline Pryor appears, telling Eddie that they are linked, and that he is needed. Come to me, Edward! Bedlam begins to be pulled away with Dylan yelling, No! We're not done yet, Dad! But as he reaches out, Bedlam is already gone, pulled into the final battle. Dylan turns back to Miss Marvel, asking if this is what she wanted. You got your way! I was supposed to save him! Were you trying to save him? Or kill him, Venom? I heard every word you said. You didn't know what was about to happen. How would you have felt if you accidentally killed your father by stabbing him in the heart and he just died? Could you have lived with that? I don't know if I'd hate myself or be glad. Or if I'd hate myself for being glad. But it'd be the end of it. Because this... This has to end one way or another. Elsewhere, Madeline looks at Bedlam, stating that he isn't quite as she left him, is he? And for that, she is sorry. She should have taken better care of him. But Chasm and her wanted different things in the end. She wanted to be whole. Chasm just wants the rest of the world to be as broken as he is. So now it is her job to clean up the mess. At that moment, a portal begins to open, and Madeline asks if he's ready. Do I get to hurt people? And then another voice tells him that it's pretty unlikely. As King Chasm steps out with his Insidious Six, telling them, For old time's sake, though, you're welcome to try, Eddie. With tensions at an all-time high, many of the heroes are at a loss as to what to do, while others are arguing who will be the one to actually take down Limbo's new king. Madeline yells that Ben stole her scythe, and with it, her throne. She will be the one to stop him, but Peter tells her that he's sorry. But wasn't she the one who got them into this mess? Ben wants Peter. That's what we're going to give him. Madeline tells Peter that he does not want to get on her bad side. Is this already not your bad side? What side are we currently on? Because all of this seems pretty bad. Madeline then yells that Ben is 10 times stronger than he was before. Why would he think that he could take him now? Peter tells her because Ben hates him so much that it makes him stupid. Or did they think his plan to take him to limbo and eat some devil fruit with some evil genius stuff? Madeline goes to respond, but then stops. Okay, you do have a point. But with that out of the way, Peter says that if they're on the same team now, he can accept that, but he has to do this. Rec Rap yells, With me, Rec Rap! Your other web guy! Sure, whatever, Rec Rap. So a little bit later, downtown, Ben is walking with Eve as the demons continue to take more of the city under control, when suddenly, one of the Insidious Six is shot with an optic beam. Leading the X-Men, Cyclops tells them, Hey, we're your neighbors. Can you keep it down a little? <laughs> the X-Men are a good place to start as any. Insidious Six, kill them! But while the X-Men focus their efforts, Madeline casually makes her way towards Ben, just as her once loyal army sets their sights on her. Ben orders them to kill her as well, and Madeline says that she made many mistakes during the course of this misadventure. But you're my favorite! As the demons surround her, the sound of a chainsaw revving can be heard as Bedlam tears through the first wave of demons. This is my friend, Eddie Brock. But Bedlam corrects her. Bedlam! Ha, right. I took his memories away. And much to my surprise, he liked it. And unfortunately for you, that's not the only thing that he likes. Bedlam begins to laugh maniacally as he charges through more of the demons with his chainsaw. What a gift to exhaust myself in your murder, and I don't tire easily. While Bedlam eviscerates the demons, Ben gives the order to pull the troops back and focus solely on the fallen queen. But that's when Peter swings in, telling him, Man, you really did get big and weird, Ben. Eve looks past him, telling him that Ben isn't the only one. And Peter looks back at Rick Rap. Who's weird? Rick Rap asks. 
What can I say? I'm a good influence on these demons, guys. Even then puts on the big bad wolf mask. Sure, sure. I was feeling a bit out of place. Least I can do is weird it up too. Eve transforms into the big bad wolf, so Peter tells Wreck Rap to handle the werewolf. Back with the X-Men, the fight with the Insidious Six proves to be quite challenging, to the point where something drastic must be done. Cyclops calls to magic, telling her to do it. And as much as magic would rather continue fighting, she shouts, fine, and begins to teleport all of the creatures away. With the Insidious Six taken care of, Bedlam finishes up another round of demons, with Madeline telling him that she appreciates his appetite for destruction, but she trusts that he's sated. Havoc begins to walk up, still in his old, tattered, and weird uniform, asking if this guy's bothering her. <laughs> Bedlam laughs, and Madeline tells him that he's trying to. Havoc looks back, asking if every demon in Limbo is coming down after them. Bedlam laughs, yes, yes, <laughs> and Madeline says that he has a rather strange sense of humor. But just before things could take a turn, the X-Men arrive to offer their support, leaving the main fight to Peter, Ben, Eve, and Wreck Rap. Eve changes Max to try and match Wreck Rap's strength, leaving Peter pretty underpowered compared to King Chasm, aka Ben Riley. With a few cracks of the scythe, Ben knocks Peter down, telling him that his life is no more use. And in the end, you have everything, Peter. But as Peter seems to be beaten, a voice calls out that there are some things that you can't steal from a man. Friends. Ben looks up in the sky to see Norman Osborn flying in with his golden glider, accompanied by Miss Marvel, who's already prepared for the battle. Ha! Huh. Thank God, I heard a dramatic entrance and thought it was the Avengers. Instead, it's just two losers I've already dealt with. Ben and Eve then turn their sights to the new additions, with Madeline finding herself in the middle of a horde of demons. They latch onto her, telling her to bow before the new king. But as soon as the demons completely engulf her, there's a burning light that begins to shine as the mountain of demons explodes, turning to ash. Madeline stands up as her power radiates. That is enough. Anyone who believes that it was the scythe who made me dangerous, come forward, so that I may eat your face! The others stare, and Jean realizes that all of the demons are bowing. Magic says, hell, I almost took a knee. Back at the main fight, Norman throws his bombs at Ben. They begin to go back and forth, with Miss Marvel stretching out her arms, trying to wrap them around Eve, as Wreck Rap yells, Miss! Miss! Your arms are misshapen and stretching all over the place! Miss! Miss Marvel simply tells Wreck Rap that she knows. The fight begins to turn in the favor of the heroes with his friends, and Ben asks if they really think that they're the only ones with friends. All of the demons in Limbo are at my command, Peter! But Cyclops corrects him. Were. All of the demons in Limbo were at your command. Everyone turns their attacks on Ben, and he's blasted away as Eve runs over to make sure that he's okay. And Ben gets up. I'm sorry, but you need to go, Eve. He cuts the air, creating a portal around Eve, but before she can argue, he warps her away. All right. Where were we? He attempts to fight off the army of demons, even teleporting Bedlam away from the battle. But Madeline stops him as she grabs her scythe, telling him it's enough. She can see his pain, and she can see that he has to be stopped. Before Ben can respond, a magic attacks him, forcing him to let go of the scythe, thus returning it to its original owner. And thus returning Chasm to regular Chasm. With the Battle of New York settled, Time began to flow once more. However, Ben sits in his prison in limbo, and he gets an unlikely visitor. Peter jumps down onto a branch, telling him that he's been busy cleaning up the mess that he left behind, but hasn't been able to find Janine or his super demonic fan. He just wanted to make sure that Ben was okay. Huh, you had to come pretty far to do that. Bravo, real Spider-Man. Bravo. Peter says that he wants to help Ben, even if they've got him trapped in this place. Just give him something. Let him know that there is something that is Ben Riley still in there. Ben stares at Peter. Without saying a word, he pulls down the chasm mask. A demon yells that Peter's time is up. So he jumps back out of the portal, and Madeline says that she's sorry, but they do have rules here. Peter says that it seems rather nice in there. Madeline tells him that the demons that she asked to devise his cell had confused ideas as to what constituted as torture. Right. On that note, I'll see myself out. Gene and Cyclops arrive, stating that their crack Cohen delegates stepped in to help move things along. But he's still surprised that the United States even went with the plan. Madeline tells him that she simply made it clear that if relations with her kingdom weren't normalized, they risked becoming more abnormal the next time. Jean asks if she's sure about this. They'll continue to support her no matter what. But is this a good idea? Madeline says that for too long, 
Limbo has held the spirits that no one wanted to face. Parts of them were condemned to darkness. Nothing heals in darkness. She'll open her arms to the rejected ones, the ones who have fallen so far. They've been starved of the light. Madeline turns to look out her window, stating that there will be no more hiding. And that's when we see that at the very base of this tower is a plaque that reads the Limbo Embassy, as it is now located in the middle of New York. And that concludes the Dark Web event, which gets you caught up on what's going on with Spider-Man and Venom, as this literally just wrapped up about a week and a half ago. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. On my personal opinion, I love what this did with Venom, I love what this did with the X-Men, I'm a little iffy on what this did with Spider-Man and Ben Riley, because I'm really tired of Ben Riley being the villain, and I'm not a fan of what they've continually done, but we'll see where this ends up going. Because we've gotten Chasm off the board now, so we get to go back to seeing what's going on with Peter Parker, and what's going on with Mary Jane. Now, there are three tie-in series that we did cut out of this. It's already super long. Uh, Mary Jane and Black Cat had a tie-in. Gold Goblin had a tie-in. And Miss Marvel had a tie-in. But it really was just them having fun during this event and battling against the villains if you want to check them out yourselves. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and join us over at YouTube memberships or Patreon. And I'll see you next time right here.